Now we move to the Mesoamerican highlands. In the last lecture, we surveyed Olmec states and then Maya civilization, which collapsed in the southern lowlands of the Yucatan around AD 900. Now we'll go up on the plateau and look at the civilizations which developed there in the first millennium BC. We begin in the valley of Oaxaca and we trace the development of the state of Monte Alban from growing village settlements in the early Christian era. Next, we'll describe the great city of Teotihuacan, which dominated the Valley of Mexico from AD 200 to 650. We'll describe how its markets attracted merchants from highlands and lowlands, and we'll discuss the importance of the city as a place of pilgrimage. Then we'll examine the political vacuum after Teotihuacan's fall and the brief rule of the Toltecs. Finally, we'll tell the story of the Aztecs, who rose from complete obscurity to become the masters of Mesoamerica in two dizzying centuries, only to fall before Spanish conquistadors who ended ancient Mesoamerican civilization in 1521 AD. Again, the theme here is interconnectedness. And then there's a second theme again, that of volatility. Rise, fall, rapid collapse of states which even only a century before had been flourishing at the height of their powers. This feature of volatility of Mesoamerican civilization. In the previous lecture, we stressed how Mesoamerican societies were interdependent, flourishing as they did in a wide diversity of environments. The appearance of larger settlements at higher elevations, like the Valley of Oaxaca and the Basin of Mexico, was closely connected to the development of long-distance trade with the lowlands. In volcanic glass, obsidian, used for mirrors, tropical bird feathers, and the sharp spines from stingrays from the Gulf of Mexico used for ceremonial bloodletting, an essential part of Mesoamerican ritual. The warm, semi-arid valley of Oaxaca is the home of the modern-day Zapotec people. It's a place where in the past water could be found close to the surface. The valley prospered. By 2000 BC, the valley supported numerous small farming villages. And as local populations rose, Larger communities appeared, and trading with the lowlands expanded rapidly, especially with the Olmec. Olmec pottery and other ritual objects appear between 1150 and 650 BC. And this was part of this process whereby many parts of the highlands and lowlands of Mesoamerica were now linked by common religious beliefs, even if local deities and cults varied considerably. As I said in the previous lecture, the influence of Olmec was enormous. In 400 BC, just as Maya civilization was beginning to emerge in the same way from small chiefdoms, at least seven small chiefdoms flourished in the valley of Oaxaca. One of these, Monte Alban, soon achieved dominance. By this time, the elite of Oaxaca may have aspired to the status of chiefs, like those on the lowlands. They adopted this iconography of the jaguar and the iconography of a feathered serpent with eagles, claws and feathers. A deity and the cult which now linked people in the highlands and lowlands alike. The feathered serpent, Quetzalcoatl. Larger centers also appeared elsewhere in the highlands at about this time. Taltelco, in the Valley of Mexico, began life as a large village in 1300 BC. But soon it became a small town. Again, this growth of a settlement, growth of population, more productive agriculture, close to a lake. And some Tlatlico art 
as strong Olmec influences as the institutions of nascent civilization spread far and wide, not by population movement, but by through constant interaction and trade. By 50 BC, as El Mirador was flourishing in Maya country, some centers on the highlands had acquired considerable size and complexity. They established a basic pattern that was to endure for centuries. Large century centers ruled by a small elite which served as commercial and spiritual locales, served by rural populations living in hierarchies of lesser communities scattered through the surrounding countryside. Not particularly large states, but in places the populations were very dense. Two major city-states dominated the Mesoamerican highlands in the first part of the first millennium AD. This, of course, was the time when classic Maya civilization reached its peak in the lowlands, up to 600 AD. Monte Alban, in the valley of Oaxaca, was a small village back in 900 BC, built on a hill overlooking the valley. The settlement grew rapidly. By AD 150, just as El Mirador was collapsing, Monte Alban became a major city. The population rose to about 30,000 people between AD 500 and 700, when the city was at the height of its prosperity. By now, the village had become an elaborate complex of palaces, plazas, and temples, atop a now artificially flattened hilltop. The city itself straddled at least three hills, with at least 15 residential subdivisions, each with their own plazas, probably residential areas based on large kin groups. The size of Monte Alban was staggering. The paved main plaza of the city between AD 500 and 725 was 975 foot long and 450 foot across, bounded at each end with platform mounds. The rulers and their families lived in a complex of buildings on the north platform, which was the formal setting for meetings with high officials and emissaries from other Mesoamerican states. It was, by any standards, an impressive state. Monte Alban coexisted peacefully with another expanding state, Teotihuacan, on the edge of the Valley of Mexico. In about 750 BC, this was a small, scattered set of villages. By 100 BC, the village was getting bigger, and two powerful chieftains were vying for power in the valley of Mexico. One of them was Tehatihuacan in the east. In the west was Cuicul Loco. And then a natural catastrophe occurred. A major volcanic eruption destroyed Cuiculco without any warning at all. The city was buried under volcanic ash. Its rival, Tehatihuacan, was now master of the valley and of the adjacent central highlands. As I said, in about 200 BC, Teotihuacan was a large village. Over the next eight centuries, the village became an enormous city. And what is remarkable about it is that it was laid out according to a master plan, which was adhered to over many generations. And at a time when life expectancy was probably in your 20s and 30s, so there was very powerful ideology uh, to maintain this plan over so many generations. Why did this happen? Probably because the city was envisaged and built as a vast symbolic landscape. A landscape of artificial mountains, the pyramids, foothills, 
which were lesser mounds, caves like the sacred cave underneath the greatest pyramid, the pyramid of the sun, and open spaces. All of this replicated the spiritual world, the cosmos of the city. The gooded plan of the city was bisected by the three-mile Street of the Dead on a north-south axis. should mention that the name Street of the Dead is a modern name. We don't know what the inhabitants called it. Between AD 1 and AD 100, the time of Christ, the colossal Pyramid of the Sun rose on the east side of the Street of the Dead. 200 foot high, with 700 foot sides, its immense staircase and five stages dominate the plaza and buildings around it. The one thing when you go and see Tehuatihuacan, and I beg you if you go there to Mexico to go and see it, it's one of the great archaeological sites of the world, you stand in front of this pyramid and you are dwarfed by it. You feel insignificant in its presence, and that was precisely the effect the architects wanted. This was a statement of power, and the plazas below, where hundreds of people gathered, were diminished by this enormous sacred mountain. And under this mountain, this pyramid, was a natural lava cave, a symbolic entrance to the underworld, discovered by accident when restoration work on the pyramid was being done some years ago. This huge complex of pyramids and plazas, which also includes the Pyramid of the Moon, Pyramid of the Moon, where they recently discovered human sacrifices, was intended to dwarf the individual. Even today, every time I go there, I feel overwhelmed. The sheer scale of this city is enormous. It's huge. Two miles south of the Pyramid of the Moon, the Street of the Dead intersects with an east-west avenue, dividing the city into four quadrants, each with their own color and their own spiritual associations. A huge square enclosure called the Suidadela stands at the intersection, and this is complete with a temple to the feathered serpent Quetzalcoatl. From recent excavations, we know that at least 200 people were sacrificed in the foundations of this temple, whose facade, which displays the mask of Quetzalcoatl and the mask of the rain god Tlaloc, depicts the moment of creation. Tehuacan covered at least eight square miles. It teemed with dense urban populations, with artisans and traders from all over the Mesoamerican world. There were even foreign enclaves where visitors or residents from Oaxaca and Veracruz lived, traders who brought critical commodities like tropical bird feathers, obsidian, pottery, foodstuffs from the lowlands to the greatest city on the highlands. But Teotihuacan was far more than that. It was an important place of pilgrimage, a marketplace for the Valley of Mexico with uneasy alliances with people living at much greater distances. It was a hub. It was familiar with the lowlands, with Oaxaca, with the Pacific and Atlantic coasts, and it received products from all of them. This was a vast state, very, very powerful. Teotihuacan's inhabitants lived in wards based apparently on kin ties and more commercial considerations such as crafts or merchandise or jobs they had. The names of the rulers are unknown, but clearly they had shamanistic roles just like the Maya. They made public appearances which were probably carefully rationed and they were considered to be gods. There were signs that in the later stages of its history, the rulers of Tehuacan became more militaristic and indulged more in human sacrifice. And then, in about AD 650, the great city was burnt down and Teotihuacan and its state collapsed.
Nobody knows why, but it's possible that the very rapid expansion of the city and a rapidly growing population may have created serious internal weaknesses. Perhaps, like at the Maya, the nobility rose to too many numbers and the demands on this urban population of more than 120,000 people may have been too much and perhaps social unrest, possibly involving war, was too much. But we know by 700, much of the formerly urban population had dispersed into rural communities. But Teotihuacan left a lasting and enduring spiritual legacy. It was a place of pilgrimage. The Aztec rulers of later times believed that their world had been created atop the pyramid of the sun. Teotihuacan was still an intensely sacred place. The collapse of Teotihuacan left a political vacuum in the Valley of Mexico. War and violence became epidemic as a dizzying array of small kingdoms vied for dominance. A very crowded political and economic landscape. One again is irresistibly reminded of another place, China. The time of the Shu, the Eastern and Western Shu, where you had this endemic warfare going on. And eventually, things come to a boil and someone dominates it. In the Valley of Mexico, it was the Toltecs who prevailed. They had moved into the valley from the northwest in about A.D. 900. They settled at a place called Tula, south of the valley, where they built a ceremonial center dedicated to the feathered serpent, Quetzalcoatl. Now the Toltecs were militant people. They were a powerful political force in Mesoamerica for a short time and extended their influence a long distance into the lowlands, even as far as the northern Yucatan. But Tula did not last long. It was overthrown in 1200, the subject of a legend which we'll come back to later, leaving another vacuum in the valley of Mexico. After the fall of Tula, several semi-nomadic Chichimecha groups settled in the valley. Among them, an obscure group, the Mexica, or Aztecs. After years of harassment by their neighbors, this humble band of semi-nomadic people founded a small village named Tenochtitlan, the place of the prickly pear cactus, in the swamps of Lake Texcoco in 1325. Only two centuries later, such was the volatility of Mesoamerican civilization, Tenochtitlan was the largest city in the Americas. At first, these humble people, the Aztecs, lived peaceably with their neighbors. Tenochtitlan gradually became an important market center. The Aztecs were entrepreneurs. They were skilled diplomats. They married strategically the nobles with neighboring chieftains. And they served as discreet military allies to people fighting one another. Within a short time, they became a powerful political force. In the early 15th century, a century after the founding of Tenochtitlan, they asserted themselves and embarked on ruthless campaigns of long-term military and economic conquest. This was at the hands of a series of very ambitious Aztec rulers. And soon they controlled a loosely connected network of states and cities across the highlands and the lowlands. By the 1420s, this network was rapidly becoming the Aztec Empire, under the rule of several gifted leaders and a remarkable vizier and general called Tlaiklaikel, who was their advisor. It was he who advised the Aztecs to reinvent themselves. As other people did in history, these conquerors reinvented themselves. They put themselves 
under the protection of a hitherto obscure sun god, which Lopochtli, the vizier and his rulers, created a vast tribute gathering machine and backed it with ruthless military force. They created another form of centralized state, a tribute machine, where if you conquered people, say in the lowlands, you assessed them for tribute each year, and this was recorded and delivered. And if it wasn't delivered, they thumped you with an army. It was backed with ruthless military force. By 1500, just under 200 years after the founding of the capital, over 5 million people lived under Aztec rule from northern Mexico to Guatemala, from the Pacific to the Gulf of Mexico. This was far from a monolithic empire. It was a mosaic of ever-shifting alliances controlled by a teeny, teeny group of rulers and high officials. Just as like most other pre-industrial civilizations, everything was run for the benefit of the elite, backed by a supremely efficient tribute and tax gathering machine. Everything was inventoried. The threat of military force stood behind the machine. So did a pervasive religious ideology. Every conquered city, every kingdom was assessed tribute in products or raw materials. Thirty-eight cities did nothing but provide firewood for the capital. Everything emanated from or came to Tenochtitlan, a dazzling and highly organized city of more than 220,000 people. Large residential precincts and thousands of acres of swamp gardens surrounded the central precincts, the hub of the Aztec world. This, again, was a model of the cosmos. A great plaza dominated by the temples of the sun god Huitzilopochtli and the rain god Tlaloc formed the central precinct. From this, four causeways emanated, dividing the Aztec world into four quarters. Aztec market, the market at Tenochtitlan, is said to have been attended, according to the Spanish, by 60,000 people a day. It is said that the bell of the temple, or the gong of the temple, or the drum of the temple, actually, to be perfectly correct, could be heard two miles away. This was a place which revolved around the sun god, around the nourishment of the sun god to perpetuate life. And at the focus of all this was human sacrifice. The Aztecs believed that Huitzilopochtli, the sun god, was nourished by the blood of human hearts. And their warfare much of it was conducted for the purpose of gathering prisoners for human sacrifice. Their society, which was rigidly stratified, included a large warrior class with different classes of warriors, the highest being the eagle warrior. And to die, be captured in battle and sacrificed on a sacrificial stone with your chest being opened with an obsidian bladed knife and your heart dashed on the idol of the sun god was considered an honorable death. It was known as the flowery death because when you died the soul of the warrior went up to travel with the sun god in the heavens. Again, it's the verity, the cyclical nature of human life, the continuity of human life that was all important. Because, you see, the Aztecs believed that they lived in the world of the fifth sun, that they lived in a finite world that would end in earthquakes and other violent catastrophes. The world had been created on the pyramid of the sun at Tenochtitlan. It was to die. You could keep it going by nourishing the sun god. How many people were sacrificed 
in Aztec domains in a year. Nobody really knows. Cortes estimated, or his secretary estimated, about 20,000. The figure is probably high. One thing is quite certain, it seems uh, for many years that the Aztec have been accused of being cannibals. Even the great American historian who wrote The Conquest of Mexico, William Prescott, talked about sumptuous banquets of human flesh. If the Aztecs ate any flesh, it was purely for ritual purposes. After the sacrifice, the body was tumbled down the steps of the pyramid, the head cut off and displayed on a skull rack nearby, and the body dismembered. But there doesn't seem to have been widespread consumption of human flesh. By the time of the Spanish Entrada in 1519, Aztec society was moving ever closer to a rigidly stratified class system with a despotic monarch, nobles, merchants and warriors forming distinct segments of society. It was a society that was probably under a lot of stress. It was preoccupied with war and with prestige and with the placation of the sun god with the sacrifice of human victims' hearts. By all accounts, the empire was an uneasy patchwork of tribute kingdoms, many of whom resented the harsh demands of their masters and were ripe for rebellion. And it's very interesting to speculate what would have happened had not Hernan Cortes arrived in 1519. How long would Aztec society have continued before it collapsed? One thing is certain, it would have collapsed because simply of the volatility of these states. It would have overstressed itself and some state on the periphery eventually would have prevailed. But in the event, the Spanish conquistador Hernan Cortes and a few adventurers arrived at the gates of Tenochtitlan in 1519. The Aztec ruler, Moctezuma, had heard stories earlier of mountains on the sea. And when Cortes arrived, he sent emissaries to look. They took with them the regalia of the feathered serpent Quetzalcoatl. Why? Because Moctezuma was convinced that Cortes was the returning Quetzalcoatl. Because Aztec legend said, when Tula collapsed, the Toltec city, and remember that the Aztecs claimed ancestry from the Tula, from the Toltecs. It is said that there was great controversy between the followers of the feathered serpent and a militaristic god called Tezcatlipoca. Tezcatlipoca's followers prevailed. The feathered serpent fed, fled from Tula, came to the Gulf of Mexico where he crafted a raft of serpents, and sailed over the horizon, vowing to return in the year one reed. By grotesque historical coincidence, Hernan Cortes arrived on the coast of Mexico in the year one reed. So it's small wonder that Moctezuma assumed that this was a returning Quetzalcoatl, determined to seize his throne, perhaps returning in vengeance. The emissaries were very puzzled when Cortes rejected their guests, gifts, threw them in irons, and fired cannons. The rest of the story is famous. Cortes and his motley army of adventurers, bolstered with rebellious states, advanced inexorably to the highlands while Moctezuma vacillated. And, in the end, the Spanish prevailed. After a bloody siege in 1521, Mesoamerican civilization, in the form of Aztec civilization, passed into historical oblivion. And in this lecture, we've described the ancestors of the Aztecs, Monte Alban, Teotihuacan, the Toltec, and then finally, the remarkable rise of Aztec civilization, the ultimate expression of Mesoamerican civilization, a ruthless, tribute-driven empire which existed to nurture the sun god in a cyclical world. 
And in the end, as the Aztec prophesied, this world ended in tragedy and chaos.